Here's Brody Brazil. So back in the summer of 2018, I decided I was going to repurpose this room and make it into a home studio, specifically for three things. Number one, to make YouTube videos. Number two, to record podcasts. And number three, to create content for various social platforms. And I needed it to look somewhat decent. It didn't have to be perfect. I started simple. I put up this reclaimed wood wall, got a photo backdrop from Amazon.com. I installed three lights, a fill, a key, and a splash behind me, and I deemed it ready. And quite honestly, back then at that point, it was. Simple, straight to the point, it did the job. But little did I know that within two years time, I'd be utilizing this very same space to host Major League Baseball pre and post game shows on a television network. Not only that, but eventually in this very same space, I'd have the capacity and ability of a small television studio, including the capability of producing live streams for the internet. So I'm calling this video Home Studio 2.0 to show you some of the improvements I've made. Not only that, the workflows I use, some of the research and development that I've gone through, hopefully to help you make some decisions in putting together your own home studio here in 2020. Let's begin with the lighting for this room and very important that I've blacked out all of the windows allowing no natural light in. That gives me complete control of this situation. It can be daytime or nighttime and everything is always going to look the same. I employ a key light, a fill light, a wash light on the wall behind me. There's two hair lights up above on each side. One has more of a warmer color temperature with a gel on it. And then there's an LED system on both of these walls behind me. It's made by a company called Govi. You can find their products on Amazon. They're not the most expensive thing out there. In fact, they're very cost effective, but very high quality and perfect for video. There is no flickering with this light system at all, and it's very customizable via the app that comes with it. Also about this room in terms of lighting, the Draycast lights that I use are dimmable, and I am able to keep them at a very low level of brightness. And that is because of the camera I use. I'll talk more about that in just a second. But keeping the lights at the lowest level possible certainly helps me. It's less fatiguing on the eyes. I can stay in this studio for a much longer time because I'm not getting blasted by lights, as with some big time television studios. Let's talk a little acoustics, and I have to be honest here, this room is definitely not soundproof. I mean, for example, when the neighbors are mowing their lawns, or blowing leaves, or when a garbage truck goes by, or when an airplane flies overhead, you're definitely going to hear it on this microphone. It is going to pick it up. This room is definitely not soundproof. But it is acoustically treated here on the inside. I've built, I don't know, several panels throughout the various walls here, and what they do is cut down on the reverberation of my voice. Uh, it does not bounce around from wall to wall and get picked up again by the microphone. It doesn't create the echoing effect that you hear quite often in somebody's home and unfortunately in, in somebody's home studio. I feel like audio is one of the most overlooked aspects of video production. At every level of video production, except for the very top. The very best in video production have great audio that go along with it. Now you really do notice a difference of how things sound as much as how they look. It's easy to focus on lighting and the camera and the set and the backdrop, but I wanted this space to be able to produce very nice video recordings, but also have radio and in fact, audiobook quality sounds to go along with it. I'll tell you a little bit about my camera. It's a Canon 6D Mark II. It's a full frame DSLR, pretty common. I mean, more used for photography than actual video production, but it's using a 50 millimeter prime lens. I'm shooting at 1080p at 29.97 frames a second. And I always use these camera settings on manual. I don't want any adjustments happening while I'm making videos. I don't want the camera to auto adjust or even autofocus while I'm making videos because nothing really is moving or changing in here that would require that. So the settings specifically that I use, these would vary for your purposes, are shutter speed at 1 60th of a second, the aperture is set to 2.0, and the ISO is set to 2000. 
And I've also actually constructed a teleprompter in front of this camera. That's right, it's a one-way mirror and sometimes I can put my iPhone down right on that teleprompter, use a specific app, and read right off the teleprompter as I do in a professional television studio. But let's be straight on this, I rarely ever use that anymore. I only use the teleprompter if I'm trying to get something absolutely word for word perfect or I need to get it that specific for a special circumstance. I'm pretty excited to talk about the new video switcher that I employ here. It's the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. This is from Blackmagic Design. This is so special. It has turned out to be the backbone right now of pretty much everything I do here in the home studio. It's a four input switcher, and it's actually very similar to what we use in professional television studios. It's got a lot of great professional level features. In fact, I'll, I'll do a whole separate video on this product soon. But you're able to overlay graphics, run transitions live, and best of all, this device, it can record straight to a hard drive as well as simultaneously stream to pretty much almost any service that you'd want to use, including Twitter and Periscope as well as YouTube. And you can do this best of all separate from your computer, meaning that you don't have to rely on your computer not crashing or your computer being slow. This is a totally separate piece of hardware. It does the job independently, doesn't get hot, doesn't make a lot of noise. This A10 Mini Pro ISO for me uh, from Blackmagic Design is, it's an absolute savior. This is a total breakthrough here for the home studio. It has been for me, and I think it would be for you um, if you're trying to do something similar to this. The other thing I wanna tell you about this switcher is that it also makes it easy if you're a one person operation because it uses macros. Those are essentially different presets that put you in various routing and graphical situations that are already, like I said, preset and predetermined. And best of all, you can coordinate those macros with a product like this, the Elgato Stream Deck Mini. I also have an XL over here as the soundboard, but the Mini is what I use to attach to this switcher so that all I have to do is hit one button and I can switch back and forth between sources. Now I'm only showing you two different things right now. I can create hundreds of different macros and hundreds of different presets and hotkeys on here, but just goes to show you how easy this is when you are by yourself and you're doing five things at once. And not only that, these hotkeys, but to start and stop a recording, that's just one button. And to start and stop a live stream, that's also a separate button right here on the switcher panel. So very cool, very simple, and very important if you're by yourself. All right, let's go back to audio for just a second. And I want to remind you one more time, I take audio very seriously. In fact, maybe even more so than the actual video you're seeing here on YouTube. And to that point, I employ several different devices to get the audio right, including the Stream Deck XL. Like I said before, this is primarily a soundboard that's connected to an app on my computer called Farago. I can hit one button, play pretty much any sound I want. But the heart of what I'm doing audio-wise rely on these two devices right here. This is a universal audio Apollo Twin X. It's a preamp, it's a processor. So it makes these microphones and everything else I'm doing sound right. I'll explain the mic in just a second too. And then this is a Soundcraft Signature 12 MTK multi-track mixer. And I mostly use that for routing audio sources if I need to create a mix minus, if I want to hear something from the studio but not send it back to the television network, I'm able to do that. So uh, a ton of flexibility between this and this and all of the different combinations I'm able to employ here. Pretty much there's nothing I can't do that I would need to do with these devices right here. Let me show you real quick what the software side of this Universal Audio Apollo Twin X looks like. This is the console that I use on my Mac. And just to show you the signal chain alone for this microphone, how much goes into making this Neumann U87 sound good. There is an SSL channel strip here, which includes some dynamics, some expansion, a low and high cut filter, a little bit of equalization and signal boosting to go in with the preamp. And then I go compression, EQ, and compression. The first compressor here is the 1176 LN, limiting amplifier by Universal Audio. You can see my settings there. Then the Neve 1073, this is a second equalization that I'm doing in terms of um, this overall signal chain. And everything I'm trying to keep pretty light and pretty natural. You can overdo it with all these plugins, 
Um, but again, this just goes to show you how much I'm putting into the audio side. And last but not least, to smooth everything out, the Teletronics LA uh, 2A. Uh, this is a great emulation from Universal Audio. So that basically right there is the signal chain uh, that is all, all running through this device right here, the Apollo Twin X. Very highly recommended. Uh, it's commonly used in musical productions but for what i'm doing here and recording podcasts and youtube stuff i mean this is it might be overkill but it's great overkill let me give you a quick look at the soundboard and i have to warn you this might quickly get into overkill mode all right like i said i'm using the stream deck here as kind of my trigger device i'm able to press these hard buttons here but it's connected to this program right here farago and i can hit any button for example there's applause you want to hear some boos Stop the applause. There's the booze. Little wah wah. Buzzer. So I've put all the common sound effects in here, and yeah, you can you can easily get carried away with this. Uh, I've got some music in here. Pretty much anything you want is one button push away, and most importantly, hit it again, and it goes away. As for the microphone I employ, this is the Neumann U87 AI. It's been called a lot of things over the years. In fact, this microphone model is about 50 years old. It's been called a beast, a legend, a workhorse, a staple, an industry standard, and all of those terms really do apply to this microphone. It's fantastic. I love the way it sounds, especially after the processing that you just saw. Is it a bit much for a television or a video production? Yeah, probably, because this is what the high-end recording artists use for music production and radio. But again, I, I just wanted to cut no corners in this and produce the best audio quality product that I possibly could. These headphones are really great for me. These are the Biodynamic DT770. Uh, 250 ohm flavor they make a couple different versions but the 250 ohm version is perfect for me because i run it through uh, the headphone amp that you see right here on the rack there's a couple things people always ask what is all that stuff over there i won't get into all the dbx processing over here that i used to use uh, more than the universal audio stuff but uh, that is simply just a db display audio meter that's just for looks uh, but below it is an eight spot headphone amp so i'm able to drive these headphones and seven more pairs if i actually needed that many but uh, this headphone amp is great these headphones are great uh, in terms of response very flat um, not too much on the high end or too much on the low side um, they also isolate the sound quite well and i'm not very good with my headphone volumes i typically have things cranked a little bit louder than they should be um, but i like to hear i like to hear myself when i'm recording stuff i like to hear the guest when I'm talking to somebody else. And so I crank these up pretty high and the sound is nice and, and isolated in these headphones. Um, the sound doesn't leak out through these headphones. They're also very comfortable. You could wear these for hours at a time and I have, and your head is not gonna get sweaty. Your head's not gonna feel like it's, it's getting clamped. So the Biodynamic DT770, a pro edition. I love these, the 250 ohm variety. Um, they're definitely, definitely good for the purpose that they serve. So last and certainly not least, I mean, we have to talk about transmission, right? Because if I'm creating all of this high quality video and audio content, how am I going to get it out in real time and looking really good? And if I can't, what good is any of it? So um, quite simply, it goes like this. If I'm live streaming, I'm using the A10 Mini Pro ISO, like I said before. Uh, it's a really great device that streams right to your favorite services. And I've got it all hardwired here. There's an ethernet jack that comes out the back, goes into a router. Everything is hardwired into my Xfinity gigabit ethernet service, which has proved quite reliable. I get great upload speeds. Everybody talks about the download speed that they get. Um, but if you're live streaming, if you're broadcasting, remember it's your upstream, it's your out, um, outstream that you're trying to get reliable and up to a pretty high speed. So let's now talk about broadcasting live on television, and I actually use the internet to do it. And a product called a DeGero Engo transmitter. This thing amazes me every time, how reliable it is, how versatile it is, how well thought out this product is. Now, it mostly uses the internet to transmit your signal, but it can also use that and a combination of ethernet, 
plus Wi-Fi, plus it also has six cell transmitters installed inside, and it can use over-the-air data to get your signal back to the television network or studio that it's assigned to. So tons of redundancy. It's not very loud. The setup menu is quite easy to use. And best of all, low latency. Usually the delay that I'm working on is about 0.7 seconds in a 60 or so mile run to the studio. It is pretty amazing how well this sends back high quality video. It can do it from anywhere in the world. All you need is internet or a cell signal. So there you have it, the Home Studio 2.0, a place that I can go live on television from, I can record a podcast, I can make a YouTube video, I can do a live stream on Periscope, on Twitter, on Facebook, even Twitch if I get there at some point, but my advice to you in designing a home studio would be this. Go backwards. Actually start at the end, figure out what you need to do with this place and what you need it to look like and then design from there. Realize what you want and what you need, and then try and figure out the products that are going to get you there. Hopefully some of the stuff I've shown you here can help. Good luck.